All right, we'll be in, uh, turn to 1 John chapter 4, uh, the introductory text. We'll start reading in verse 4. And this is part 56 in our verse by verse series in the letter of 1 John. And to t- uh, the title today is taken from verse 7 Let Us Love One Another. Joe read uh, a text in the scripture reading out of Thessalonians, and it was uh, mirrored some of the things that were said here. Um, I'm working with um, a different computer. I, my other computer bit the dust. Um, a different type of recorder, so I'm, I'm a little bit tense. Uh, you know how change is kind of weird, and that's what i got going on here today. So, start reading in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. We'll read down to around maybe verse 12. <clears throat> and you are of God, little children, and you have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God, and he who knows God hears us. The one who is not of God does not hear us. From this we know the Spirit of truth and the spirit of error. In other words, we know the difference between those two spirits by who hears us and who doesn't. Beloved, this is the verse we're looking at today. We're going to start in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another for or because love is of God and everyone who uh, loves has been born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love has not known God for because God is love. In this, the love of God was revealed in us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us, referring to believers or the elect, and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if we so, I'm sorry, beloved, if God so loved us, in other words, in that way, we ought to also love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected or completed in us. By this, we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Now, last week we did a we did a separate topical message. We weren't in the series, but the week before that, um, or maybe I think the week before that I preached in uh, Lexington, but the week before that, our last installment is was part 55, and the title was, Is the World Against Us? And that was taken out of Verse six. Let's look at verse six again. Remember, we when we came here, and I and I alluded to this verse probably a half a dozen times before we got here because it's such a um, it's a hardcore verse. It's a uh, as we said in that message that it was kind of a summation. It would it brought us up to a at the time a, a peak of look. You know, here's the line. Here's where the line is drawn, and it was tied to so many things that we had already talked about. Uh, it is a bold, dogmatic statement by the Apostle John under the inspiration of the Spirit. And I had mentioned that um, when you first look at this, if you don't have a grip on it, maybe the first time you've ever read it, it's like, man, <laughs> you better know what you're saying when you're saying this because you're drawing a line in the sand between you and the world. Um, we are of God. Again, John talking about only the elect believers. He who knows God hears us. And and we talked about how this is talking about the gospel. Hears us concerning the gospel. Not side issues, not preferences, not political views, 
not hobbies, not church building aesthetics, you know, um, things like that, not hobby horses, but the gospel, which the gospel should be our hobby horse. The one who is not of God, that's the, that's the world, that's the unbelievers, does not hear us. We know, we know this, we know they can't hear us until and unless God gives them an ear to hear. From this, from what, it, what John just said, we know the difference, in other words, between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What is your gospel? Who is your Christ? Which Christ do you have? Do you have him? What is your plea? Right? This is, it gets to all these things. So this chapter we know started out in verse 1 talking about uh, test the spirits to see if they are of God or if they are not of God. Why? Because many false teachers, many false prophets, many false gospels, many false Christs have gone out into the world. So the statement in verse 6 is a bold, dogmatic, inspired words of John, the Apostle John, and it shows why it is so important that we see it and understand it and uh, understand it in its context. Now, this just goes back to what we've taught in this ministry really for decades. Um, how to judge saved and lost? Is it by the law or by the gospel? This again, we when we see verses like that, we need to reiterate, hey, we have to judge saved and lost. It's a mandate. Do we know how? And then how does that play itself out? So let me remind you again, uh, one of the reasons why I got interested in teaching the letter of 1 John, because when we get into these exhortations about loving the brethren and so on, we know false teachers turn these into conditions what got me interested, I mean, I, I, by God's grace, hopefully that he'll let me teach through um, as many books of the Bible as possible. And sometimes I make decisions on what book to go to next. And what pressed me, uh, one of the things that pressed me to go to 1 John was um, Stephen Lawson, who he's pretty popular. He's uh, considered a lordship salvationist guy, uh, very popular, conference speaker, he's written a lot of books, uh, he's been in the news recently, a lot, but he said that uh, in his, about this inspired letter here, he said it was a test for evidence of regeneration, and there were nine tests within this letter, and if you didn't pass all nine tests, he said you're going to hell. And I've seen him over the years, you know, quote some things out of First um, John and, and use First John as um, as a club to beat fear into people that he even thinks is believers. Uh, now, there's a this morning I put this video that I'm referring to that really prompted me to do this to go ahead and do this book of First John, a video by Steve Lawson. I've got it on my Facebook today. I put it up, and some of you here in the congregation have seen it before, and even some listening you know, on Facebook Live and other platforms have seen this video. It's about a four-minute video, and um, to find it, you just type in the search Steve Lawson Unregenerate Church. It'll pop up. It's got kind of a yellow background. He's standing in front of a pulpit being interviewed by a guy. And so how do you think, having said that, you guys can look at that in your leisure, and um, more than likely somebody on Facebook will dump it down in the comments. I think it's four minutes and nine seconds. So many things of Steve Lawson's been taken down a lot. I mean, you can't hardly find some of his things because a lot of ministries have taken his stuff down because he... Um, got caught up in some some things recently. 
And I don't go after Steve Lawson because of that. I go after him because of his false teaching and his legalism. And he created his own storm, and he's stewing in it right now. Um, in other words, I really believe that Steve Lawson and some of his buddies judged, saved, and lost by the law rather than the gospel. This is why he even brought it up. So how do you think somebody like him would interpret verse 6, that bold dogmatic statement there that John mentioned in verse 6? Well, he's going to have a different slant on it than, than we've been talking about when we started this book, a completely different slant on it. He's going to turn it on its head. He's going to teach the very opposite of what we're teaching. So if you know his doctrine... And if you know on top of it, if you listen to him enough, if you know his attitude connected with his doctrine, then that would make more sense on knowing what he would teach if you haven't heard uh, him concerning some of these things. So me asking you to consider that really doesn't have much impact unless you know what we teach here as compared to what Steve Lawson and his buddies have taught over the decades. And we're going to start looking at verse 7 here. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Starts out, again, we've talked about this in, in many of these different verses, where John sets the stage, a lot of times the very first word in a verse or sentence, beloved. So he's making that distinction. He's talking to believers, those that are loved by God. It's an endearing term that expresses God's love directed to his people. And even John writing this, his love directed to those that he's writing to, those that he originally preached the gospel to especially. Now, again, um, John, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, continually goes back to make a distinction between these two categories of peoples, unbelievers and believers, right? Children of the devil versus the children of God. Those that are in Adam versus those that are in Christ. Those that are under condemnation versus those that are justified. Sinner versus saint. Uh, in darkness versus in light. Lies versus truth, the world versus believers, you know, and there's there's probably some more, and we've we've covered uh, some in in the past few months. So we've shown thus far that this letter it, it talks about an all the way gospel, not a partial gospel, not a halfway gospel. It's an all the way gospel. It's about the sovereign work of God in Christ to present His people perfectly righteous holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. That's what the gospel does. And if the gospel doesn't do that, if you don't see yourself in the gospel when you believe the gospel, I don't know if you're getting it or not. Which is just another reminder that it's not talking about Frequency of sin versus frequency of obedience. That's not what this letter is talking about. And that's what the legalist does with this book. And we've pointed that out um, several times. Now, the second part of the verse, look, notice it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now, and then it says, For love, because love is of God. Now, the word love here, where it says, let us love one another, it's in the form of a verb, which is an action word. You know, um, <laughs> sometimes people wonder why I go so slow through things. I know um, I was mentioning, talking with Joe earlier, we were talking about something associated with that. I said, well, I think I might get through two verses. I said, you know how slow I go. And he's starting to get used to it. Um, and so sometimes I'll bring up things that might be super basic. But I, I can't assume, especially on, on camera, those that are listening, I don't know what people do and don't uh, know as far as like basic grammar. I don't even know all the grammar I need to know. But I know that a verb is an action word. 
I remember years ago, <laughs> this guy I used to work with, he's like 15 years older than me. He said, all I know is a noun is an action word. And it's like, no, it's not. And if that's all you know, you don't know anything. And I helped him out and I explained, and he found out later and he corrected it that a verb is an action word. Now, you know, I, I need to say that because the word love is here in a minute going to be mentioned as in the form of a noun. So we have to make these distinctions. The second use there for love is of God is in the form of a noun there when it's talking about um, God there. And it goes on to say, and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. So let's... Let's briefly uh, readdress. Again, we're going to dip into the basics, and this is something I just want you to uh, like brand on your brain. Um, repetitiveness is helpful in teaching, and really, if anybody knows and understands this thing already, they should be glorying in this truth to be able to see the distinctions between grace and salvation by conditions. And we might want to dip a little bit deeper than we have in times past. So in salvation, I mean, this is vital that you get this and, and remember this. And this is part of the all the way gospel idea. In salvation, we're talking about salvation of a person. In any part, any degree, so here's the question. Is salvation in any part, any degree, conditioned on what a sinful human being does, who they are, or what they continue to do or be in improving by maintaining salvation by their actions or their attitudes? In other words, conditional salvation. It's, I mean, it's, I'll tell you now, it's not. There is no such thing as God requiring from me, in and of myself, some condition in any way to gain salvation, to maintain salvation, to make myself more righteous or more holy. When it comes to salvation in that sense, my character and conduct does not come into play as the difference maker. It has to be actually excluded because if it was not excluded, what? I would have room to boast. And that is against salvation by works or grace. That is, that is salvation by, by works. It's against salvation by grace. So we can name some things, you know, in the form of some questions. And this is popular, this idea of faith being a condition. So that's the question. Is faith a condition? I hear it all the time, and and from Sovereign Grace, Calvinist Reform people all over the place, YouTube, social media, you know, Facebook, X, Instagram, all these different places, they're pushing this idea that faith is a condition. I mean, they'll say those words. And they'll go further and they'll, they'll explain in their teaching that faith is an offer. That's why it can be a condition because they say it's an offer. And you have to take hold of that faith and then do something with it, right? Here's faith. Do you want it? And usually they say, okay, well, now take your faith and place it in. God doesn't work that way. He gives the gift after regeneration. He gives the gift of faith in a powerful way with the same power that it took Christ to raise from the dead, and he works it in God's people irresistibly, powerfully. And by the time you got it, you don't know what to hit you, and it's, it's exercised by the power of the Spirit. Again, by that time, it's too late. He has defeated you by giving you life and giving you faith. He gives you a new heart and all these things. So faith is not a condition. In other words, these statements like you have to believe in order to be saved. That's the way they frame it. 
Uh, what about repentance? Some might say, well, faith's not a condition, but, but repentance is. No, it's not. Repentance is a gift of God, just like faith. You know, and then, so we've kind of knocked those away and they, what, what else will they come up with? Well, you know, my desires, you know, which is tied to sincerity. Um, I mean, God just, I mean, what more could he ask for just to like do your best? He doesn't accept our best. Our best is altogether vanity, it says in Psalm 39, 5. He only and always accepts the Lord Jesus Christ's best. That's the standard. Is making Jesus your Lord a condition? All these are going to be no's, big no's. Is denying yourself a condition? Is dying to self a condition? Or dying to sin, is that a condition for salvation? And, you know, we, we bring it right to our text. Is love a condition? These are the things we have to ask, and I think we have to continue to ask as we bring in new subjects and put them up in this slot of what, if anything, is a condition. And I've already shown, and we've talked about, and we will continue to talk about, and we know and understand that there is no condition that we can fulfill, even, even the subtlety of this, even with the innate and enabling of the Spirit working in us to do it is not even a condition. Now that's the ones people's going to have some problems with. And it's going to, I mean, that statement, uh, some people would like to murder me because of that. I mean, that's, that's an offensive statement. Even the enabling of the Spirit working in me does not produce me fulfilling conditions in my cooperation with the Spirit to become saved. We need to get an understanding on that. Now, these things that we've mentioned, all these things where we've asked these questions, is faith, is repentance, is love, is sincerity, all these things. What they are is they are a fruit of salvation. They're the effect of salvation on God's people by His free and sovereign grace. So people who make those things conditions for salvation, any part of salvation, is sanctification salvation? Yes, it is. These people that make things conditions for salvation, they are measuring and they are quantifying them by their own standard, not the standard of Scripture. Now, we already know that God will always and only accept absolute perfection. That's his standard. He's not going to accept anything less when it comes to salvation, which for believers, that requirement, that demand, that standard was met in Christ by his doing and his dying, by his law keeping and dying under the penalty of the law, by the only law keeper, the Lord Jesus Christ, as their substitute, representative, surety, mediator, advocate, propitiation, and all the other things that he is to his people. He finished the work, in other words. He fulfilled all the conditions. He obeyed the law. He satisfied the law under its penalty for his people. If you reject that, you're, you're, you're believing a different gospel. If you think the work is not finished and you've got to finish it by fulfilling conditions to, to finish up the little bit left, Christ did all he can do, now the rest is up to you kind of thing. You don't know the God of the Bible. You don't know his character that he only and always demands absolute perfection. It's only found in Christ. So all, all of that, all of those things that he did, he finished the work, he fulfilled the conditions, he obeyed the law, he died under the penalty of the law to satisfy it. All those things were what? They were expression, 
They were his expression of his love for his people. And, and that's what we're going to see in, um, for sure in verse 9 and 10. We're going to see that. When sinners make conditions for salvation, that is their little practice in alchemy as they put together a recipe to create a works-based false gospel. And people are good at it. It's what they do by nature. They're, they're used to it. There's been thousands of years of that, of that tradition passed down, and that lie continues to be propagated because of the father, their devil, the father of lies, the spirit of Antichrist. So that is a basic violation of the, of the teaching in scriptures where we're told not to mix law with grace. We can't mix the two. And we, we here strive to be very careful to guard against uh, that type of thing. And we make a law gospel distinction. Uh, and we even do it in evangelism. Um, and when I say that, what I mean is, you know, the gospel... Somebody asked MacArthur one time, what is the gospel? What do you say? First thing out of his mouth, it was that one dude, um, the sitcom guy. Somebody give me his name. Tom Friedman. No, the guy was in the sitcom. Um, shorter guy. Hell's Best Kept Secret thing. He helped put that together. Anyway, it, somebody will come up with it later. Curly-haired kid. Um, he was interviewing him. Guess it doesn't matter. He said, John, what is the gospel? He said, repent and believe. That's not the gospel. Uh, I don't remember the kid's name now. I, I don't know. No, no. This is a dude that was in a sitcom in the 90s um, or 80s. It's not Ray Comfort. I'm watching the comments. Um, I'm not saying it was... No, before that. This has turned into a, a, yeah, yeah. a sitcom quiz show. It's not eight. I don't think it's eight is enough either. But uh, Kirk Cameron, Kenneth White wins the prize. Kirk Cameron, he was interviewing. So, you know, the gospel is the gospel, and then separate from the gospel is the appeal to repent and believe. The gospel is the declaration of a finished work. And then the call to repent and believe is separate from it. And if you blend those two, you're blending law and gospel. The gospel is done. It's not due. They're blending due with done. So even in evangelism, as subtle as it can be, you'll, you'll turn, you'll turn. And not only that, MacArthur believes in the free offer and so on and common grace on top of it. So, this means if you make salvation conditioned on the sinner, you believe in salvation by works, salvation conditioned on or based on or contingent upon or ground upon the basis of some form of law or command that you take action on. You know, so the fatalist, you know, would say, uh, so, you know, Scott, you're a fatalist. You know, you don't even believe that the gospel should be preached. You know, they, they usually jump to that conclusion if they're not familiar with our ministry. So to foul up on the gospel with adding things is, is pretty much an abortion of grace, right? Romans 11, 6. It's a go-to verse on proving that. That if by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace, right? You make grace void. You've canceled it out. So, and unless that is understood by a human being, they're going to stay blind. They're going to stay hanging out in their own righteousness, their own personal righteousness. That's going to be their refuge. That's going to be their plea. They're going to take that to judgment. They're going to be talking about what they did or didn't do. The verse goes on to say, And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now, let's bring these ideas into our thinking when we ask 
about assurance of salvation as it relates to measuring what we think and what we think of not only ourselves, what we think we see in ourselves or even in others. Bring in the idea of, of uh, assurance based on measuring some of these things. Is it safe? Do believers, here's, so here's some questions. Do believers ever love enough to meet the standard for acceptability? We have to, we have to ask and answer these questions, first of all, for ourselves. Get this clear in our minds. And don't ever go back and doubting your answer if it is the correct answer. Do believers ever love enough to meet the standard for acceptability? In other words, do you love like Christ loved? No. So the answer is no. So we need to make up our minds once and for all time. You know, if we could just do that on that, there'd be a lot less problems with assurance of salvation. Somebody a few months ago, you know, called me up and it was specifically dealing with love, but I don't love enough. The only one that did was Christ. Give up on it, man. Yeah. Not saying don't love, I'm saying don't think that you have to meet Christ's standard of love to be able to measure yourself as acceptable. I'm accepted in Christ's loving whoever he loved. He's my substitute. Does that mean that I don't have to worry about love? No, I'm teaching it right here. Let us love one another. Um, but you'll have these goofy uh, legalists saying, you know, pointing the finger. So if our works are not, I should say, since our works are not the object of God-given faith, then our works cannot be the ground of our salvation or even the ground of our assurance of faith. You should only have assurance in the object of your faith, Christ. I'm not told to look inside to be assured. Paul said, in, my, in me, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. How can you be assured by looking inside? Here again, the subtlety, some would say, well, we're not talking about looking to the flesh. We're talking about those things that the Spirit enables you to do. I'm not accepted by that. I'm accepted by the finished work of Christ. The fruit of that work is the Spirit working in me. There is a difference. The legal aspect drives the Spirit work in us. Now, God-given faith is assurance, and it looks to Christ alone. I did a message in this series that faith is assurance. People hate that too. And I know why, because it undoes their legalism. And, I, and uh, you would think a believer would like it, but it's almost like you know when, when some of the apostles were preaching against the, the idols, the idol makers in the book of Acts lost business. It does the same thing here. When we shatter the idols of a works-based salvation, the false teachers lose business, right? So there's this fear when we talk about grace being as free as it is. There's this fear like this is not safe. If you make grace that free, people are going to abuse grace. So what do they think? Well, they think well, we need to bring some law back in and you know, bind people, keep them in line by law because grace is not enough, they would say. Well, I mean, okay, so should we go back to the old idea of comparing ourselves among ourselves? Paul clearly said in, in uh, one of the letters to the Corinthians, he said, that's not wise to compare yourselves among yourselves. You're, each other is not the standard. Not only that, what are the implications of that? What does that do? It causes division and friction and finger pointing. I'm better than you. I'm holier than you. I'm more righteous than you. On and on and on creates an atmosphere of, of uh, self-righteous wickedness. We are not the standard. Christ is the standard. 
So we are initially shown that, you know, when we're converted, we're regenerated, converted, we, we, we see him high and lifted up, sort of a snapshot of, uh, and like in Isaiah 6, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and he said, woe is me. You know, he, he was shown who he is in and of himself and that he needed a righteousness outside of himself. And so we clearly see that we were in need of a righteousness and, and what they call an alien righteousness, one that is not as our own. It's foreign to us. It's not our own righteousness. It's outside of ourselves, alien to our own selves, which can only be outside of ourselves and not in our inside ourselves, not only initially, but ever in this lifetime. And it's after that point that we should stop comparing ourselves among ourselves and even comparing ourselves to Christ. I mean, have we got that down that we can never do enough and Christ did what was demanded and required? He fulfilled all those conditions. And that should settle that. And now, now we I don't have to compare myself to Christ. I have His righteousness. I am... I am made to be viewed by the Father as His equal when it comes to righteousness for my justification and salvation. So we have that righteousness credited to our account by grace from God, by His merit, by His doing and dying, nothing that what we did. So if salvation... Uh, in any part, if it if it if it lays in the in the lap of the believer, even if it was even sanctification, what what creeps in? It's allowed to creep in our minds, and it will infect our gospel. It will create doubt, fear, and guilt, like before we had faith, just like that. Do you think that? I kind of already gave it away. Do you think that comparing ourselves among ourselves would even actually cultivate the spirit of love among believers? It'd do the opposite. So loving God and loving one another is a fruit of the spirit that God works effectually in his people. And he gives it in measures, just like faith. See, there's that, there's that temptation <clears throat> to compare ourselves among another and see like, how come this one in the church or this one over here seems to like love God more than me? And he seems to love the brother, brethren better than I do. Or negatively, how come he seems to not love the brethren as much as me or love God as, there, there we go, we're stepping back into it and that's not good. God gives these gifts in measures. And he gives them at different speeds, too. I mean, somebody could be a believer for a year, and he might be have a higher measure of expression of his love to God and to the brother of, compared to somebody that may be converted for 20 years. That's God's business. He does that. That's not our business. We are to get our nose in his word. We are to pray. We are to count on the Spirit. We're just responsible for that. Uh, the text that Joe read earlier it's pretty much said you know don't be a busybody mind your own business don't be you know nitpicking people to death where you create an atmosphere where you come into uh, a gathering and even if it's outside of the of the assembly where people feel like they're walking on eggshells and they're afraid to speak it's ridiculous so it's enough. He gives enough in these measures. He gives enough, and then he grows us through the God-appointed use of means. So loving God or loving our brothers and sisters in Christ was never a condition for salvation of God's elect, nor will it ever be, ever. So we are under the dominion of grace, and God's grace is said in his own word to be sufficient for us in every instance. So this love, this verb, it's caused by God. We are not the cause. It's a work of God 
caused by His work through a God-given understanding, by the work of the Spirit in this revelation to our minds, in other words, with an understanding. And believers know and have learned that we love God because He first loved us. And we love the brethren because God shows us how that He has loved us and works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure in that very thing when it comes to even loving Him or loving the brethren. So the latter part of verse 7 says the reason this works is because this love that we're talking about, when we love Him or the brethren, is of God. This love is of God. He is the cause, and that is not coming from us. We can't take credit for it or boast or brag and so on. Verse 8, The one who does not love has not known God for or because God is love. We've already spent time uh, making distinctions on the how and the why this love is not specifically like the Old Covenant command. There is a difference. We've already covered it in this, in this series. So just a little bit of refresher. It's a specific love um, to what is said here re regarding a new commandment. You remember that phraseology? Both Christ said that in the Gospel of John, and, and John the Apostle spoke it in this letter. He said, a new commandment I give unto you. And it's new in the sense of the way that it works and, the, and what the focus is. We saw, uh, we went to reference something that Paul wrote concerning the same thing. He talked about, uh, do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. He's talking about believers. Not, in other words, as contrasted to not the world of unbelievers. Now, that's not to say that we just forget about this command to love our neighbor as ourselves and even love our enemies. We're not, we're not to throw that out. But this command, this, this exhortation to do this is different in that, I mean, everything's different about it. It's a new covenant command. The motive is different, the reason is different, the incentive is different, and it is restricted to loving our brothers and sisters. And um, it is not grievous to us. In other words, it's not bondage. And again, this is, a, this is one of the biggest reasons why you, you need to know how to judge saving and loss so you can determine who your brothers and sisters are. So this is, it's different, it's separate, it's special in the how and the why in the new covenant aspect of the command. In other words, in its reason and in its utility of it. The one who does not love, that's referring to those that don't love the brethren, which in the context is those that left with their false gospel, remember? It says, has not known God because God is love. Right? That's pretty self explanatory. Anyway, somebody that's not a believer, anything and everything they do because they don't have faith is sin. That's what it looks like to be in the state of total depravity. So, in conclusion, I just want to consider one more thing. So, what is the perceived problem of um, a lot of people that disagree with our gospel? When they talk about freedom to love out of our free will before it can be real, they'll say, you guys reject free will and you believe in the absolute sovereignty of God. God doesn't love everybody. And so you guys are a bunch of robots and you can't love God freely. And if you can't love God freely, then it's not really love. It's, it's coaxed. It's, you know what I'm saying? You've heard this before. I heard it yesterday on a video, and I, I put it up in a private group I run on Facebook. It is probably the most clearest and expansive explanation of that, which was just utterly ridiculous. 
there's some things to consider uh, about that that weak argument. First of all, here I mean, here's the bottom line: if you consider the biblical doctrine of total depravity, which automatically rules out free will, man, when they come into the world, let's get a reminder: they are legally condemned. They're declared under condemnation because Adam's sin is legally transferred to their account, and that is the legal state that they're in. That's the first problem. They are spiritually dead. They have all these inabilities. They can't love, right? In the way that we're talking about here, in loving God and loving the brother, can't do it. They, there's none that seeks after God. There's none that understandeth and so on. So there's all these inabilities under total depravity. And then also, propitiation, as we'll see in verse 9 and 10, is the driving force that shows us we love Him because He first loved us. This, this fix in total depravity, this correction, of course, is justification by Christ's righteousness imputed, and then a new heart he takes out the old heart of stone and he puts in a new heart and it is a heart that now understands and that the Spirit of God is dwelling in it and then it's irresistible, this love. I mean, it's like we, we find, we were looking for these people. Where are they at? They're so hard to find. And we find one, it's like jackpot. Here is one that believes the same gospel. And we know the difference. We can tell the difference. And so between the idea of total depravity and just being immersed in and our minds saturated with the love of God that's expressed toward us in His satisfactory death and satisfying law and justice, it, that is what brings out this love. And before we were regenerated and converted, we didn't know anything about that death. We didn't understand it. Uh, we had that uh, quid pro quo thing, you know, like like give to get, uh, so that we could take credit by things that we did, tit for tat. Um, sin got me into this thing, obedience will get me out, and I'm working to meet the standard, and I'm improving all the time, and I'm becoming more and more holy and sin less and less and less in my progressive righteousness, right? That is satanic. So this whole argument about freedom to love I mean there is a reality in our minds when we love God and love the brethren we are we are doing it uh, freely in the sense that we've been given those things through the power of God and he works in us both to do and uh, to will and do of his good pleasure so our wills are changed when we're given a new heart before that it's not gonna happen it's not gonna happen any attempts before that is de uh, dead works, self-righteousness, in other words, sin. It's just more the same pylon of heaping up wrath to the day of judgment. Um, so we're going to look at, uh, there was another verse I was going to do. I was really going to really get down more on this, uh, how sin is transferred and some of the docetus heresy and how all that mixed in there. I think I'm going to flip it over to chapter 5 because chapter 5 still deals with this people denying that Christ came in the flesh. I had a lot of reading material and I, my computer went dead and there was all kinds of things that got in the way. So more than likely we'll be going down, just continue to go through these next few verses next time around. Any questions or comments?